Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin our study here this morning. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> the dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have to study this morning. We invite your spirit's presence as we open your word together. As we continue to look at the book of Judges and set everything in order. Help us to understand these things. We pray, Lord, that um, this can be more than an intellectual exercise, that we can be spiritually benefited as we understand uh, prophecy and how it relates to our life today, that it can help us in the decisions that we make, that it can bring conviction and power to our lives, and that we can minister to those around us. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So um, this is a chart that Stephen sent me. This is uh, the number of prophetic days between the first and last 40-year periods in the book of Judges, which produces a number equating to the combining of the number of years of which the last four judges brought to view um, in the book of in the book judged so that means those are the, that they judged in that period so we have um now this is just uh the number of years that are given for each of these uh periods of oppression and each of the periods of the judges and we know othniel he's going to judge for 40 years and that's the first 40 year period in the book of judges and then the Philistines are given a 40-year period. So from the end of that to the beginning of the latter, from the, the former, the end of the former to the beginning of the latter, we have 302 years. And 302 times 360 is 108,720,000, or 108,000, pardon me, 720. Um, and you can see that Elon, Abdon, Ibzan, and Samson uh, reign for 10 years, 8 years, 7 years, and 20 years. Now, we know uh, they mention uh, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon in a different order than that. But still, that's the period in which they judge. So it's going to be Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, not El Elon, Abdon, and Ibzan. It doesn't really matter. It's, they still have those numbers there. And then Samson judges for 20 years. So we got all of those numbers. So that's pretty interesting. And, and it was kind of interesting when I opened it up in WhatsApp and I just opened it up. I guess I already had things zoomed in or whatever, but it was zoomed at 187%. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, wasn't intentional. This I'm sorry. What, what was that, 187%, the view that you were using, the Zoom? Yeah, the Zoom, on? Yeah, 187%, yeah. <laughs> no, that's I really thought, rich. Yeah, I just thought it was kind of kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so, so just sometimes those things happen. In this case, that's what happened. Um, this one here that you're looking at right now, because um, this, I put it in a different pro program. It's opened at 194%. Um, but uh, that's what it was when I first looked at it. 187% in the other, in WhatsApp. Okay. You now, can't make this stuff up. Well, yeah, it's just pretty interesting. Obviously, this whole thing here as well. Uh, right. It's just because we did note, of course, the, the 10 years and the eight years and the seven years, because it was, uh, you know, seven years, then 10 years, then eight years. And in Hebrew, if you're going to say 18, you say 10 and eight. So so it's seven. That's July, obviously. And then the 10 and eight is the 18, July 18. So that symbol is there. And now. Part of the thing in our study of the judges, we've, we've shown that the judges represent this July 18, 2020, 
as well as other symbols that relate to our movement. And, you know, we're not making the argument that the book of Judges, uh, that that's the actual, like, initial application you would make for the book of Judges. It's just that the book of Judges, uh, God designed for us that we could see our history in it because it's going to speak to our history. Um, but those symbols could be understood in different ways at different times. And, but that just shows you something about the word of God, that it, it has something for every generation. Um, but we do know that all the prophets wrote more for our time than for their own. But we're not saying that that's the ultimate interpretation of judges to apply to our history, but it does apply. Now, um, uh, so one, one point I want to uh, just discuss just really briefly. So um, uh, this weekend I was talking to someone on the phone about this a little bit about what the role of this chronology is in our history. Why we even have this chronology at all. Why, why did God give us chronology for this movement at this time? Because that's what we're addressing in uh, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So, so why were we given chronology? <clears throat> because we didn't have it in this movement earlier. And when we're looking at um, uh, Ehud, for instance, we're going to see that, you know, Ehud is going to address the 2520. So, so we were given the 2520, but the 2520 expands into this whole message uh, related to time setting, a type of time setting. So why was that given to this movement? especially when it seems to be in contravention of Ellen White's counsel regarding that the third angel's message does not hang on time. I'm sorry, that was a question? Yeah. So why so are we given, please repeat it. Why are we given time, time setting, chronology in our history? And we talked about it before. Right. We know that uh, there was time in Millerite history and we're repeating Millerite history. So that's one of the reasons. But why specifically are we given this time in our history of this movement? Well, I would personally, I say to wake us up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But there's more to it. OK, so I mean, who introduced time? In what respect? You mean uh, person-wise? Yeah. Sorry? Time setting. Who introduced time setting? Uh, Parminder? Yeah, so Parminder is going to introduce time setting to this movement. And so in 2012, you know, Tabo's living with me, and, and Parminder... Uh, makes this prediction regarding the Sunday law in 2014. And of course, Jeff responds to that. And, and I find that Tabo is a part of this secret study group. So he knew about it. And, um, and he was quite concerned about uh, Jeff call, saying that what Parminder was doing was fanaticism. So Tabo never really agreed or disagreed with Parminder, what Parminder was doing. You know, he didn't say, oh, that's terrible. Parminder should never have time set. Um, he seemed to be friends with Parminder. Uh, you know, they had a connection with him in some way. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't uh, really defend him either, right? It was just he was concerned about it. And <clears throat> now we know um, that... What ended up happening in the end is the time setting of Parminder was the thing that undid him to a large degree, right? Because they're going to set a date, November 9th, 2019, and that date is going to mark a closed door for the Omega, right? So that's what it turned out to be. 
So, so the thing that I found is, for me, it was an important part of the decision seeing that there was, because I was just analyzing the Old Testament prophecies. I wasn't interested in time setting. But the fact that it witnessed, so the fact that I was on there on October 13th, witnessing to this November 9th date, in the way that I did, I could see that God's hand was in it. Right? I could see also that there was fanaticism connected with this November 9th date. That I, I, I was kind of surprised at people's reactions to it. And that they just accepted that this was going to be this close of probation where they would no longer sin anymore after that. I mean, because like that's just crazy, really. Um to have that type that of that entitles magic. Well, yes. It's not so, that's gonna happen unless you work on it. Yeah. Well, I've never well, it's not just a matter of working on it. It's a matter of understanding righteousness by faith. Um so true. So one is I've never believed in the magical sky fairy, right? That is, you know, we don't take God as somebody who just gives us what we want, does these miracles, right? That the Christian life is about character. And um, it's like, uh, you know, for instance, you know, I can use Heidi as an example. When we first got married, she obviously had... Um, uh, some trauma and and those things affected her ability to uh, you know they affected her health right and and she wanted to heal from that so you know in praying for that God didn't just heal her automatically there's a whole process in which a person God wants to heal not just the body but he wants to heal the mind and you can't heal the mind. You can't heal the mind without the trials that we face, right? So it, it is a process that we go through in our experience that brings about healing, right? So people often want, you know, they want the mountain moved out of their way, but the mountain is put there for a reason. Right, so that we can climb that mountain, so we can develop a Christ-like character. But that's what people were looking for with the November 9th, two thousand nineteen date. Right. Okay. Right. So people often expect that you know we would just like Paul. He wants to have his his vision so that he can see perfectly. Right. He can't write letters. Because when he saw Christ, he was blinded, even though his blinding was healed, he still didn't have good vision. That's the thorn in his flesh. Ellen White, she had uh, health problems. That constantly came, you know, she got healthier as time went on. Right. Wasn't she able to write with a crippled hand? That's that was what I under I, I've seen in it. She was able to. It was I think she even praised it. Uh, is that it was God that was allowing her to be able to write that with the hand that she was using? Yeah, I, I don't know about that. I, I don't remember that story, but definitely she received strength when she, you know, pre presented or when she had to write, and often she was unable because her health was so poor. But, but the point is, people are expecting just something magical to happen. They're not expecting, you know, they're, they're not looking to the fact that God needs to heal them, you know, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, uh, through these trials and physically, through these trials that we experience. They're part of our character. God doesn't just remove things. But that's what people were looking for. And, and we see this similar to July 18, 2020 as well, for those that, that were expecting vindication. Right? Yeah, that's what it seemed like. Mm -hmm. so, so in all of our experiences, we, all of these trials that we face, whether they're, you know, physical illnesses, uh, 
things that are happening around us, broken relationships. All of these things are um, in, important to our character development. Okay, so um, sorry about that. I just had an interruption. Um, so when we look at this time setting that, that was introduced, is there anything better that God could have done than what he did in bringing time into this, to this movement as a witness? And do we see this in the book of Judges on how he's um, witnessing to what's happening in this movement. Like to me, it, it's a very miraculous in, in, in a very positive sense, how God works. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. All the tokens that he's given us while we are making our studies, it's just, to me, it's it's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because God could have done things differently, but you know, for instance, we have uh, the seven times Leviticus twenty six. God using the sabbatical cycle as um, a punishment. Right. That is, he, he says, you know, if you don't keep the sabbatical cycle, your punishment is going to come to you in cycles of seven. Right. That is. The punishment. Meets the uh, fits the crime. Right. So, so to speak. You know, when this movement. Introduced time setting in the way that it did first through Parminder. And Parminder is coming to this movement, seeking to take it over. God allows Parminder's time setting to become part of this movement. But at the same time, he has an answer to that. And it's going to come in the form of time setting. So when it comes to this time setting that we have, when it comes to all these dates in this chronology, we know that this is not our message to the Levites, right? The purpose of this is not to predict some event in the future that we can then be vindicated by. But do we have people still expecting that somehow this movement is going to be empowered by us predicting an event? It, it seems that way. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of... Well, I'm surprised by it in some ways, you know, because we should have learned our lesson. We should have understood why time setting is in the movement. Um, I remember back in 2018 when a uh, <clears throat> guy from Romania, I can't think of his name, but uh, um, he presented some, you know, he's a phys physicist, right? So he was presenting some stuff regarding, um, you know, all these patterns and cycles. And he was saying that, you know, we could, maybe we can find these natural cycles and we can pred predict, you know, when Jesus is going to come back. And then, you know, I, and then he said, maybe, you know, maybe that voice of God that's talked about in early writings isn't really literal, you know, that it's, it's really through that we come to understand it through studying these cycles or patterns. Now, I rebuked him on it, which uh, he didn't like at all, um, because it's really quite clear that only the Father knows, and he's going to reveal it after the special resurrection. 
And if we're going to start spiritualizing uh, the end time events in that way, um, we, we're open to all kinds of deceptions. So the one thing I was clear on in my understanding of time setting is that we, we can't be time setting in contravention of Ellen White's clear counsel. That is, she gives clear counsel about time setting. And so any of this time setting, any of these dates, this chronology, is meant for us at the present time. And the fact that we're still in this time setting, so to speak, means that the events that people are looking for can't possibly occur. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Well, it does to me. Yeah, because if, if we're setting time and we end up predicting some event that's part of God's promises, part of these end time events, then, then Ellen White is wrong. And she can't possibly be wrong about time. But this time that we have here, when we're analyzing these dates, the significance of these dates and they're part of the structure of prophetic chronology is only understood after those dates pass. Now we could look at, you know, for instance, October 13th. I mean, it's part of a structure where Daniel from Brazil makes a prediction uh, about 126 days from the camp meeting in Italy that it's going to be on October 13th, 2018, that the message of time is going to be uh, preached in America, right? Now, 10 days before that, Tess gives the date of, of, of November 9th, right? So 10 days before October 13th. So that's going to be on October 3rd. And, and we mark October 13th as the midnight cry. And she gave two presentations. One was called 10 years and the other one was called the midnight cry. So 10 days later, the midnight cry is given, right? So we could see that's part of this structure. So on October 13th, we figure out that November 9th is part of a, you know, 391 and a half days from October 13th. And so we have all of this witness of time, right? So when I'm there on October 13th, I realize that we have this, this time, this, this date is witnessed to by the structure of prophetic chronology. But I don't accept the reasoning about what's going to happen on that date. Now, you know, of course, we all discuss this. We look at, you know, what they're predicting about these Russia and the United States. But the only thing that I can see that November 9th is going to be is a close of probation for the false priests. And of course, that's going to eventually be the Omega movement. So I didn't know who that was. But that's because I understood the symbols from my study of scripture that what they were predicting didn't make sense. That is, it wasn't witnessed to by the scriptures. Now, they were going to attach, of course, Raphia to November 9th. But even in looking at that, there's no reason for us to assume um, what Tess proposed. Right. I mean, there was some ideas, there's some support because, you know, it wasn't like she predicted something that made no sense. There was sense to it, but there was just problems with it. There was problems with what she presented about um, these various battles and what they typified uh, and the types of battles she chose. And so, so I knew that there was some problems. I just didn't necessarily know what they all were, like how to resolve them. So it's not really till after the July 18th failure. Well, it's actually before that, because I understand we're on a line of failed predictions. November 9th is on a line of failed predictions. Um, so when we look now at Shamgar, <clears throat> Shamgar is the third of these uh, judges that we all mark as this single line, right? And this is, of course, a zoom in to 9-11 on the line of the judges itself. And, and the line of the judges is a zoom on, on the arrival of the second angel, which is 
in Jeff's line, right? And of course, Jeff's line will zoom into the Sunday law and Ellen White's line, right? So we're, we're moving down these steps. So we have Ellen White's line, Jeff's line, the judge's line, Othnell, Ehud, and Shamgar's line. And now we're going to look at Shamgar's personal line, or not as a person, but the line of Shamgar by itself. So we're now five levels down, right? This is the fifth level from Ellen White's line. And, you know, of course, Ellen White's line is, is also a line that's um, zoomed in onto uh, from a line above it, right? So I mean, that's the whole, the, the really big line from creation to recreation. So, so you could say this is the sixth zoom in down. But this, this line is going to start um, with October 5th, 2012. So in this line of Shamgar, I mean, this is an event that's significant for me. So... It's 77 days before the 13th back tune. So on the 13th back tune, when the world's supposed to end, so that's a failed prediction, right? We're going to see uh, December 21st, 2012. So that's 77 days before that. So, so even in this first part of this, this would really be a personal line for me. So probably we could zoom into this and I would see, you know, my personal line. There, there would be other things in connection with this line, but this would be connected with me. But here on this line of Shamgar, this is going to be about the July 18, 2020 prediction. That's what it's going to, but actually ends up the third angel arriving on October 13th, right? So, um, so October 13th becomes a focus here as it does with the line of Ehud, it goes to October 13th. But this, this is going to ultimately lead to the fourth angel arriving July 18th, where in Ehud, we see it goes to November 9th as the fourth angel arriving. So, so we can see how they're related, these two lines. Now, Shamgar, uh, we, we went through, um, through this just briefly um, yesterday. So we have this, this sword, an answer, slew, 600 men, the ox plow, the goat, right? We can see these symbols here come from a very short section in, in the book of Judges, just a few verses. So let's, let's go there to Shamgar. So it's actually just one verse not even a few verses, just one verse. So one verse becomes this whole line. So, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew the, of the Philistines 600 men with an ox gold, goad, and he also delivered Israel. So that's a very short verse, even. It's not even a long verse. And yet we can draw a line in it, right? We can draw this out as a line. So how do we do that then? How can we come up with all of this from that one verse? So the way that we did it is we did the sword. Now we're going to mark this sword October 5th, 2012. So that's just going to be um, the name of Shamgar, right? Yeah, that was that's that's his. Uh, I believe that's what his name is, means. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have a period of darkness. So, what is the period of darkness that's going to exist before October fifth, two thousand twelve? So, have a line. We have darkness. So, this is an increase of light. So, what would be the darkness? Um, time setting. Okay. I, I would think yes. Right. So in 2012, we have Tabo who, or, or, or who I'm living with 
He's friends with Parmander in a secret uh, email study group. And, and um, uh, so in, in 2012, Parmander makes this prediction in the spring regarding 2014, right? And so that first angel's message is going to address that. So, so we have this message arrive. Now, we say it's a sword. Now, on October 5th, 2012, it's a camp meeting that we have in Alberta. It's at, in Devon, uh, just a little town not far from here on the North Saskatchewan River. And, and we rent this for the weekend. It's, it's the, the Thanksgiving weekend in Canada. And I actually make a Thanksgiving meal for everybody on, on uh, Sunday. But um, this is this is a um, I think this is a Friday morning. So it's a Friday morning. That's going to be my first presentation that I ever make in this movement. Well, uh, the camp meeting started Thursday night, so um, that's going to be Jamal who presents on Thursday night. But I'm going to present on Friday morning, line upon line. So I do that uh, Fridays, Saturday, and Sunday morning. I present this line upon line presentation, three presentations, starting on October fifth, um, which which we've gone through before in understanding these lines to set up set an order upon a line from here to here, right? So that, that's what we're doing in doing this. And so, is that the sword? That line upon line method. word of God shall be unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little and there little. Is that what's being presented on October 5th? Is that a sword? Because remember, Shamgar is a message, right? Yeah, it, it makes sense. Okay, so we have a message that's being presented that is going to be an answer to the time setting of Parminder. Because the reason why Parminder can make that error, in part, is that we don't fully understand these lines yet in 2012. Right? It would make no sense to predict the Sunday law in two years, back in 2012, if we understood the lines. Because we didn't understand what line we were on. So to just predict the Sunday law out of nowhere, I mean, now we can look back and say, well, you know, we didn't even understand midnight cry yet. I mean, we did have a midnight cry on our line, but we didn't know when it was. And we definitely didn't have a midnight in a midnight cry. So, so, the, so we have this sword. And then he's the son of Anath, which is the answer. So the answer here uh, relates to, to what? August 31st, 2013. That's Ezra 7-9 is going to be figured out. And is that does that make sense that that's an answer to the time setting of Parminder? It seems that way. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the light that this movement has received is that is how it progressed. That is, Ezra 7 9 opens up, of course, the chronology in 457 BC. Eventually, we see the structural chiasms and their relationship to. Um, 1844, especially in context of Samuel Snow's letters. So without the understanding of Ezra 7, 9, there's no way that we would even have any way to interpret or understand Samuel Snow's letters as part of a structure. So 
So here we have this answer. Now, in there, I put some increase of knowledge. Now, that increase of knowledge isn't, isn't stated in that verse, um, but I note that that date, October 5th, 2012, is 77 days before the Mayan calendar date of 13.00.000. And that's going to be 777 days before I turn 52, right? And so we know that whole thing, 52 times 360 is 1,872,000. And, um, and, and actually on that date, it's my birthday is, uh, there's 273 days of division there. So if we count to the actual day from my birth to May 9th, uh, 2014, which is the 26th day of the fourth month on the Julian calendar, it's going to be 273 days. So we have that structure of uh, 525 and 273 that we have in uh, the 777 at the end of that chiasm, right? That's going to be there with November 9th. Um, so that becomes an important uh, part of this line. And we're going to see that, uh, um, you know, September 23, seven, 2017 is on that line from September 23 to November 9th. It's again, 777 days. But it's going to be this camp meeting in 2013. Now, you can see here um, probably what I should do is is move this line here, or not the, this line here, over, you know, to something like this. I'm just going to do this here and, you know, put this. Uh, what did I do there? Put this here. You know, and have a little uh, arching, one of these things. Put this here. Because, you know, you want to have that date there. Now, so the increase of knowledge begins um, over here, right? But it's the 777 days goes here. That makes sense. <clears throat> so we sort of need that uh, line in that way. And it probably can make this. Okay, <clears throat> so this increase of knowledge, and I'll probably move this over here, maybe. Let's put this in the center. Okay, so there we go. So we have this increase of knowledge. Now it begins with this Mayan date and um uh, but we're going to have this answer so now it's not like the mayan date itself uh, gives me that answer for august 31st but it's going to be connected to that so and and remember an align is always an increase of knowledge so we have this increase of knowledge moving through this line okay so I could have maybe kept it the way it was, but I'm, I'm putting it like that. Just makes more sense to me. Okay. So then we're going to have uh, that he slew, right? So that's going to be Noel on June 22nd, 2014. And the word slew is 5221. In Hebrew, so that's the Hebrew five two two one. I probably should put an H in front of it so people know what that is, right? And yes. and that symbolizes December twenty fifth. If you put it in reverse, and Noel 
that comes from Christmas. I don't know. I, I would assume Noel was probably born around Christmas time. But uh, so on June 22nd, he's going to um, do this presentation, which we had in the line of Ehud as well, to 2014. And of course, this makes sense in the context of what was being predicted in 2012 was the Sunday law, right? So, so what we could put here is the Sunday law prediction, right? That's going to be the period of darkness. Okay, makes sense. So we can see how the empowerment of that message is going to be in 2014. Now, specifically, how does Noel's counting of the first day of the fifth month, how does that, how does that practically um, empower this message that challenges Parminder's time setting? It's, it's kind of a trick question. Question again? How does what Noel presents on June 22nd, how does that answer to Parminder's Sunday law prediction? Because was Parminder correct in predicting 2014? The, the year 2014. So as a structure, now it's true as a structure, so Iran put as a structure maybe, but I think he was correct because what he was actually predicting was the division that occurred in the movement in 2014. He thought he was predicting the Sunday law. And if you look at his reasoning, it doesn't make sense to predict a Sunday law in 2014 because he's using 1888 and a 126 uh, shekels plus 1863 and 151 shekels, right, to come to 2014, right? But is there a Sunday law in 1888? No. Is there a Sunday law in 1863? No. No, right? So what he's doing is he's tying it to to 1888 and 1863, but he has no evidence for a Sunday law, right? That's the way that I would look at it. Right, he and, wasn't tracking that. None of that stuff happened in that time period. So how did he how did he equate to it? Well, you know, there was a proposed Sunday law, right, in 1888. Yeah, but that was a proposed Sunday law. Right. Yeah. So it's a proposed Sunday law. So to say that you're going to have a Sunday law. I mean, you could say it's a mirror, you know, so the Sunday law was proposed and now it's going to occur in 2014. Um, but, you know, Ellen White's pretty clear. We can't predict the Sunday law. So to predict the Sunday law in 2014 makes no sense. But he is predicting something. Now, you know, maybe if, you know, Parminder had dropped out of the movement and he never brought time setting back in again, you know, that would all have been forgotten and it wouldn't have mattered and we wouldn't have had all these dates and everything. But Parminder is going to persist, right? So even though what he's doing is called fanaticism, he's going to uh, persist in um, getting into the back into the movement, back into Jeff's good books, because he has an agenda, right? So this group that they had in 2012, included Tess's mom, so Terry Lambert, and other people who were instrumental in, uh, in the movement um, of the Omega as it developed. But we didn't know that, right? So it was all secret. 
which of course is not a good sign. Somebody's being secretive. Um, the only reason they would do that is to manipulate, right? So Parminder has an agenda. He's not going to let people know that he's working towards some agenda. And so even the people he's working with may not fully understand what his goals were at the time. If he had told them, they probably would not have supported him. But over time, they came to see things the same way that he did. And that's this, the, the, you know, that's the secret chambers. It's a pretty dangerous thing. Okay. So by sword, that's line upon line, you did answer. So we're going to get the history from the book of Ezra. We're going to get that as this answer. And Noel's going to slew, right? He's going to slay um, this darkness, right? So this, this message is now represented as slain, right? And, and of course, we know December 25th becomes an important date, right? It's not, it's not in this line per se, but it is part of this line, part of this, these bigger lines. And so the fact that we have this uh, Noel presenting this on June 22nd. And the other thing we need to remember is Jeff also marked uh, June 22nd in 2011, right? And so the center date between June 22nd, 2011 and June 22nd, 2014 is that Mayan calendar date, right? That 12, 21, 12. So the increase of knowledge here uh, that's going to lead to this formalization of the message, this Ezra 7, 9, that's going to be this key, right, that then is going to be empowered when Noel presents this. So he's going to present what I discovered on August 31st. That is, I did the calculation that he later presents. Okay. Now that message needs to be accepted, but is it accepted by the vast majority of this movement? When we get to 2014 in the fall, we're going to see that 600 men are going to be slain. Right? So why 600 men? And that's going to be the camp meeting where I present chronology. Right? So I'm marking October 20th and 21st, my two presentations. So that those dates, those days underneath the 600 men, 365 plus 235, which does make 600, right? Yeah. And yeah, so 365, number of days in a year, 235, the number of months in a metonic cycle. Okay. And if you divide, can, can, can I ask you? 1666. Yeah. Can I ask you to identify that in that line so we could? We have an idea that that's what it is, 235, metonic cycle, and 365. Um, yeah, so what I probably should do is just draw a box separate. I don't want to put it right on that line itself. So um, That's all. Okay. Um, so maybe do it this way. Anyway, something like that. It's probably too big. Yeah. What's that? What's that? Uh, and 365, 235 equals 391. Yeah, six, 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 six. yeah. So you see 391. Get this way.
Yeah, so you can see that the 391, that's just a decimal that's that's created by that. 391, of course, the 300. Oh, that's that's division, what you're doing there, 365. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, and of course, you can see the symbols there. Yeah, right. And we've seen this in Thank other you. decimals as well, where that you can divide them into do two different um, like groups of three, right? We have that in... Um, the one where we had three, two, one, um, one, six, six. Or was it? Yeah, yeah, one, six, six. Or was it six, six, one? I can't remember. Anyway, it represented FFA and the Sunday Law, three twenty one. I remember that. Yeah. So, so we we've seen this in other decimals, and often they can be grouped in in the threes like that. But anyway, so that deals with that second angel arriving. So now we have this message that arrives is more specifically that the message of chronology arrives in 2014, but more specifically the symbolic use of the spans of time, right? So Noel's message is important in order for this second angel's message to arrive. Now, of course, when it arrives in the movement, it, it's pretty much rejected by most, but it's Right, even at the time it's presented, people walking out saying this is a waste of our time, right? People did not like numbers. Like, it's maybe hard to understand for us now, but when I presented chronology, not only did people's eyes glaze over, uh, they were angry. They didn't want to have to deal with math, Right? But also, there's a fear of numbers in in Adventism, right? Yeah, date Why setting. Did, yeah, so nobody really heard of Jeff Pippinger. You know, maybe a few people here and there. But when the twenty five twenty became a tag to Jeff's movement, automatically it's fanaticism, right? Well, that People was the general impression throughout. You the don't even Advent need to know what it, you don't need to even know what it's about. It's just it's a number, right? It's a number that you don't know what it's about is part of the the scary thing, but you know it's time setting, right? People would say, you know, that twenty five twenty group that you're you know studying that's time setting. They believe Jesus is coming back in twenty five twenty. Or they'd say 2025, right? They didn't even know what the number was, really. <laughs> yeah. I had to explain it to people that uh, was talking schmack about it and didn't even know what they were talking about. Yeah, right. But it was just that irrational fear of numbers in Adventism that has anything to do with chronology or dates. And so this movement wasn't very accepting of uh, people are talking about... Um, Chronology. It, it's got to be fanaticism. Um, Pat Rampey, the first time he actually heard of me, he was pretty sure I must be a fanatic of some kind because I had all these, these dates and stuff, you know. And Jeff asked me too in 2014 in the summer there when I presented in Alberta, where he first heard me present this. That's why he invited me to speak at the camp meeting in October. You know, he asked, are you got any of these dates going into the future? You know, um, because he wants to know, am I time setting? Right. So this is just a feature that that um, characterizes Adventism. They don't want to hear about time. There's no time after 1844. Any mention of time, even prior to 1844 is scary to them. You start nailing down dates in biblical history and showing some kind of structure of prophetic significance of spans of time or their connection, they're not interested and often quite worried, right? Yeah, so, they treat it like a taboo. Yeah, it's a taboo, exactly. So, so this is what happens to this movement in 2014 now we are introduced with this chronology now um 
on July 16th, 2016. Um, this is a week before uh, Heidi is anointed. I end up, uh, because of circumstances of weather, you know, there's a storm, um, I think on the Thursday, that takes out the power for hundreds of thousands of people in Arkansas, including the School of the Prophets. But Lambert Church doesn't get its power back for a week or whatever. And so um, Daniel from Brazil, he was supposed to speak that Sabbath, and he couldn't uh, get his stuff translated in time. So he asked me to speak in his place. And instead of speaking at Lambert Church, it happened to be at the School of the Prophets. So I do the presentation there. But it's, it's the Sabbath presentation, right? So I do the Sabbath sermon. And that's going to be on Ezekiel and showing the 391 um, and a half years, right, from the book of Ezekiel dealing with the prophecy of Josiah and et cetera. So the three, 390 and the 40 plus the span of time to um, the destruction of Jerusalem and its connection to Revelation chapter 9 and the 391 years and 15 days, Josiah Lich's prophecy. So, so Jeff is impressed by this, right? He um, takes the copy of the meeting and he gets it made into DVDs and is handing these out, you know, for the next while. So, and he also says that um, we're going to see a lot of things coming from the book of Ezekiel in the future. So Jeff was impressed with the whole idea that we had solved this chronology problem of the 390 and the 40, and that it was connected to the prophecy of Josiah. And so we can see how this is a formalization of the message. Now, I did present that in 2014, but not with the prophecy of Josiah connection. I had presented that there was 391 and a half years um, so I, I knew the spans of time. I just didn't know what to connect them to, what started, what he, you know, how to to connect the 40 years, especially, right? So what question? Yeah. Uh, Noel's topic. That's going to be Ezra 7 9. Ezra 7 9. Okay. Right. So he's going to mark August 15th, 1844, as the midnight cry. So before that, like, that's what I figured out <laughs> on his third, 31st, but, you know, nobody knew, uh, you know, that I wasn't important in the movement. I was, you know, I'm nobody, right? I'm just a guy at the camp meeting. I mean, Jeff had seen me in 2010. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I talked to him. I, I'd just been married, you know, a few months before to Heidi, so I was introducing my wife Heidi but Jeff didn't really know me right so when he asked this question regarding Ezra 7 9 and regarding the calendar he was presenting 120 days for the Levites or for the priests part of me and then 70 days for the the, uh, the Levites he was taking that from the 12 and the 70 that are sent out whatever that is Matthew 10 is Matthew 10 verse 12 verse 5 10 verse 5 anyway and then Luke 10 verse 1 I think it is anyway <clears throat> so you could look those up um so Jeff didn't know that there was 29 and a half days in a month that he just thought the biblical calendar was 30 days in a month so he's going to take those four months four times 30 that's 120 and then two months plus 10 days that's going to be 70 right so they, they hadn't placed that in Millerite history yet. So it took time. It's kind of interesting how long it took compared to uh, how quickly things developed later on. But at first, it was quite a struggle. And even for me, I mean, I understood the biblical calendar to some degree, but I'd never figured out the first day of the first month in 1844. And I wasn't really quite sure how to count, like, do you count the first day as one or do you count the first day as zero? So do I do a cardinal count where I count 
zero than one, right? Or do I count that first day as the first day uh, to get my final number, right? So we know if we count cardinally from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, it's 186 days. But if we count ordinally, ordinally it's 187. So there was still things I didn't know back in 2013 about the calendar. I mean, I wasn't, um, I wasn't even really quite sure how the calendar was determined as far as I knew it had to do with the sighting of the first visible crescent, but I wasn't even sure when that happened. Like I hadn't thought about it before. Like, does it happen in the morning or the evening? You know, it, it, it just hadn't occurred to me at that time. Right. I mean, I'd read lots about it, but it, I probably well, that was in 2014, 2013, 2013. Yeah. So, so I quickly began studying this. So by 2014, uh, I was pretty well versed in uh, a lot of the biblical chronology. So in that year intervening year, I'd spent a lot of time studying. Plus I just got married to Heidi. So I had lots of time to study 40, 50 hours a week. So I'd never had that much time before I'd been studying it you know, since 2010, you know, specifically stuff dealing with the 2520. Um, but yeah, in that year, I had a lot more time to study. And so when I presented in 2014, first in Alberta, and then in October, I had a lot more figured out. There still was things that I hadn't sorted out. So in 2016, what we call the formalization of the message, we're going to have the symbol there of the ox, and the plow, right? So uh, what would be the significance of the ox and plow? We never mentioned this before. Um, I mean, we talked about the plowing, so that's gonna be line upon line. So we have July 16th, I'm presenting Ezekiel and Revelation 9 that they're connected with the 391 and a half. <clears throat> so he's going to slew these 600 Philistine men, and then we're going to have this ox goad, right? Right. So this ox goad, why, what, how would that be connected to July 16th, 2016? So ox are used for plowing, right? Yes, oxes are for plowing, yes. Could it, could it refer to Eglon being a male calf, so a bull or an ox? Okay. And also Luke 9.62 says that no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, so there's... There's some things there. I mean, obviously, Eglon is not connected to Shamgar because this is going to be over on, on the west coast, not over by Moab, but but it's still part of these these lines. Um, uh, and E.G. White had died July 16th, 1915, so it's 101 years after her death to the okay. date. Okay. So 101. Okay. Anything else? I mean, obviously the plowing line upon line. So we're going to have this connected to Ezekiel and Revelation 9. So, so we can see that this is a plowing the line upon line, right? That gives us this understanding. But I'm placing it at September 23rd, 2017. Or pardon me, and the goad there, right? So you've got the ox, 
I'm putting it July 16th. And September 23rd, 2017, I'm placing the goad there. The goad means to teach. So I'm taking this one thing. He slew, I guess it's three things. Slew, uh, 600 men, four things, with an ox goad. And I give you four different way marks. Is that reasonable? And do these re way marks make sense based upon the meanings of these words? Uh, yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. So, so September 23rd, 2017. Now the goad means to teach that's going to be Samuel Snow's letters. And it's going to be 777 days before November 9th, 2019. And, um, it's going to be, um, a week after Heidi's healed. So that's seven right? Seven days, right? When she's anointed by Jeff. Would that be significant as well? Because we have this symbol of 77, seven and seven, seven, seven then, right? Could definitely play a part. Uh, pardon me. It's not seven days out. That's going to be uh, a year in seven days, right? So it's the date that Heidi's healed in 2016 is going to be seven days after, right? Said it wrong. So, right, so I present the Ezekiel in 2016 on July. No, it's not seven days. Um, it's the 23rd, but it's this 723. That's the, the point of this one. So 723, this is going to be connected with Ellen White's vision in 1850. Okay, so there's where we have this connection. So 1850, she's going to have this vision that is supposedly on September 23rd, right? And at 7:23, well, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm getting everything mixed up, right? So 7:23, that's going to symbolize September 23. Is September that's 7:23, 273. Heidi's going to be healed on July 23. So that's uh, that's also a 7.23. So I skipped some set steps there. Does that make sense to people? We have July 23, which is 7.23. And then we have September 23, which is also 7.23. But it's one year later. Is that connected at all? Or am I getting too deep into numbers here? I'm trying to make the connection with seven and September. Sept means seven. September was the seventh month. Still is the seventh month. Well, it's the ninth month now on our calendar, but it was the oh. seventh month Sorry. in the Julian calendar. Now that makes more sense. So okay. if you could notate that, uh, it would it would come into clarity. Okay. So, yeah. Now, and so I'm connecting 723 because now Heidi's anointing is important, right? Because I meet Heidi on that um, date, the Mayan date, right? That starts the 777 days. And that's going to be 77 days when I meet her after that October 5th study, right? And, and then we're going to have... Uh, this September 23rd date, that's the empower of the second empowerment of the second angel's message. And, and I give that, uh, the formalization of that message seven days after the formalization of that message on July 23, Heidi is anointed and healed, right? By Jeff. Um, so, so this, those symbols there that week connected to 723, we don't have it on this line, the, July 23 date, but it's connected to that. And, and it's connected in, in the fact that there was this storm that was supposed to be an anointing service on July 16th, but it was delayed a week. And in that period of time, uh, Heidi had been invited to then uh, be anointed. And so if the anointing service had been on July 16th, Heidi wouldn't have been anointed. So that storm, and there's lots involved in that storm, 
symbols and things that happened that actually lead to Heidi being anointed a week later. So there's a whole story regarding that presentation of Ezekiel. There's lots behind it. It's not just some incidental uh, presentation. And it's the first time they're going to have uh, church at the School of the Prophets rather than Lambert Church. Right? Yeah, I thought that was interesting. That yeah. you It didn't happen at Lambert Church, but it happened at the School of the Prophets. Right. And then we're going to see... Yeah. And then I'm going to be at Lambert Church on September 23rd, 2017. Right. So so both of these could have ended up at Lambert Church, except that if there was no storm, I wouldn't have presented on July 16th, 2016. I wasn't scheduled to speak. Right. Um, so there's there's just a lot involved in these things that happened. Right. These these dates and why we would put them as these way marks. So on September 23rd, 2017, when I present Samuel Snow's letters, uh, we're going to say this represents uh, by the goad, which means to teach. Now, why specifically is that a powerful symbol for that date? Now, we know it's a failed prediction by the evangelicals. Right. So the evangelicals make a prediction. It's going to be the trumpet in the other line, right? Because that's going to be the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. That's the first day of the seventh month on uh, the biblical calendar. But we got the teach there. So now, and what I'm doing is I'm condensing all of the stuff that I had been presented. So I'm, I'm actually a teacher at that camp at that uh, school. So in 2016, I'm a student, but in 2017, I'm a teacher, right? So they invited me to teach and I present on Ezra seven to 10 and, and then go into Samuel Snow's letters. So what I'm doing at that sermon is I'm giving an hour presentation of Samuel Snow's letters. And, and I'm showing that this July 18th date that the last letter is published on is the symbol of the prediction before midnight with no indication that that's really what I'm, that it's referring to a date that's going to occur as part of a prediction in our movement, right? So I, I didn't have that idea or sense of what I was really saying, right, on September 23rd. I didn't know about the evangelicals prophecy. I didn't know it was the first day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. Lots of things I didn't know. Um, but we can see there I'm as a teacher. Okay. So would that, that sort of help? Now I need to make a footnote up here. I'm going to probably put this like that. Now, it's, it's interesting, too. It's also the first day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. So I would think that that's relevant there. Yeah, it's, it's a tie to um, Ezra, isn't it? Um, well, there's no first day of the seventh month in Ezra. I'm sorry. Other, well, other than on the first day of the seventh month after uh, Cyrus's decree, they're going to build an altar. So they arrive at Jerusalem and they're going to build an altar on the first day of the seventh month. But but there is in, in the, so, but that's just in the book of Ezra. It's not in the story of Ezra per se, what we call under Ezra's leaving Babylon. Yeah, the line of Ezra. Okay. And then, of course, um, delivered, be open. Uh, this is uh, because he also delivered Israel. And the word delivered 
means, um, well, a number of things to be liberated, be saved, be delivered, be saved in battle, be victorious, to save, deliver, save from moral troubles. Um, uh, and, uh, but properly, the word means to be open, wide, or free. That is by implication to be safe, right? So we're just using the word in that sense, uh, to be open. That's why I put that there. Um, but it's delivered, right? So October 13th, 2018, when I make that calculation, 391 and a half days at noon, October 13th, um, this is a, an arrival of a, another message, right? And this message is going to be uh, leading to ultimately all of the stuff that follows later, right? So we can see that we can zoom into this October 13th date and we can actually create a whole other line. And now we don't have- um, That's that 813 number, right? Well, you could have 813 because October is the eighth month, yes. So Palmona is going to open up this stuff, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'd notate that on your uh, on your PowerPoint there as eight thirteen instead of October thirteenth or yeah. whatever. Okay. okay. Um, do with the plus sign. And I'm just saying these things so you know that know. if I can. It, it it helps me to remember. If it helps me to remember, it might help other people to understand. There you go. There you go. which can actually lead into a subtopic on this whole, that whole date right there. Yeah. Now, so when we look at July 18th, now July 18th doesn't, there's nothing in Shamgar that we can mark July 18th, right? That is, we have this line of Shamgar and then I say, we have this fourth angel arrive and that's gonna be July 18th. That's what I'm saying. Um, well, the only thing that we could do is we could look at the last word and, and we could put here, instead of a question mark, we could put Israel because that's, who's going to be delivered. Now, is that reasonable to put Israel? as this fourth angel arriving, what would that mean? Um, spiritual Israel. Um, the uh, movement is going to have mo more clarity. I mean, those are the things that I see in that date. Okay, so when we look at a line, so if we took... If we took the line, Ellen White's line or Jeff's line, the, we have this close of probation, right? Let's take Ellen White's line. So we have a close of probation. Now, the close of probation is, is in Ellen White's line, it, we have the, the second angel join the third angel, right? Then you have a loud cry and you have the close of probation. So... The close of probation parallels October 22, 1844, correct? Correct. Okay. So, and, and after the close of probation, on Ellen White's big line, not October 22, but the third angel's message arrives, you're going to have the third angel's message would be empowered with the close of probation, right? And then you're going to have the 144,000, 
go through the time of Jacob's trouble, right? Right. And the time of Jacob's trouble is connected with the fourth angel in that big line, in a sense, if you want to look at it that way of how Ellen White, Ellen White's line works. That is, there is a repeat of history that occurs in connection with the time of Jacob's trouble, the second coming, the thousand years, um, you know, the great white throne judgment and all of these things. We, we don't normally think of that, right? Because, and that would be, that would be after, after a major reform line, you have, have this, um, all, all these failed predictions. Usually has to do with the building either being built or destroyed, right? And of course, this is going to be Jerusalem coming down from heaven, right? So this is the eighth way mark in that line of Shamgar. Now, if we are going to look at this, and this may be a little, I don't want people to be confused about it, but you know, in the line of Shamgar, we don't have anything other than that Israel. But if we looked at, at um, July 18th as a line, right? Because we're going to see this later in the book of Judges, right? July 18th is a way mark. If we go back here, um, in the line of the Judges, which is the arrival of the second angel, right? Correct. And in this line, we have, you know, this, we have October 13th, 2018, and September 7th, 2019, as marking the formalization of a message. So, so in here, in these lines, we start to get these, these lines are all overlapping, right? They're all interconnected, like wheels within wheels. But, you know, that right now, we're just looking at Shamgar. So you could see with Shamgar, if we looked at that line, we could see that that Tola and Jair, which is going to be July 18, 2020, that that's going to be the second angel, right? Remember, the fourth angel is the second angel, right? So if we just go down then to this line here, in making July 18th the arrival of the fourth angel, I'm just consistent with um, this line of the judges, right? So that the fourth angel here in this line, right, this is which is the second angel, in the line of Shamgar, that's just going to be the second angel arriving. So... What's being prefigured in this is the line of uh, Tola and um, Jair, right? That is, this, this is what's being talked about here as well. But it's still typical of Israel, which is Jacob struggling with the angel, the time of Jacob's trouble, and receiving the name of Israel. So July 18th is connected to that, that whole line. Does that make sense? I, I, I don't want to confuse people by that. but Because we just need to remember that Shamgar is actually a zoom in to the third angel arriving in the line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And the, the line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar is a zoom in to the first angel arriving in the line of the judges, and the line of the judges is a zoom into the second angel arriving in Jeff's line. And Jeff's line is a zoom into the Sunday law and Ellen White's line, right? But you can see the logic of it. And you can see why these waymarks show up in these different lines. These dates show up 
in different lines as different waymarks because they're a different line. But those waymarks are not exclusive to one line or those dates aren't, the events aren't. And then we can see that if this is about this darkness and this Sunday law prediction of Parminder's, that when we get to this October 13th, and I count the 391 and a half days, which Tess rejects. So Parminder first initially accepts it because he invites me to speak at the camp meeting and present it. But once Tess hears about it, she's not happy with it. And she's the one who told me this, right? <laughs> she told me that in 2019, in June of 2019, when she spoke here in Alberta. And yeah, she says, I, I don't accept that 391 and a half days from October 13th as any prophetic significance. I, she says, I was not happy with that, uh, you know, basically being acknowledged by anybody. So yeah, she just, you know, it, it what didn't come from her, so it, it can't be valid. Right. And as I pointed out before, there's three one and three three hundred ninety one point five days between uh, the birth of um, AOC, her hero. Um, and. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, Tess's birth. Right. So. AOC is born October 13th at noon in New York in 1989. And Tess is born. Uh, November 9th, 1991. That's right. No. no, 1990, right? 89, 1990. So, <clears throat> but I don't know if she ever thought about it, but, but that would be the case. I've never told her that. Okay, so we can see how that all fits together. That then July 18th is... Um, going to be the empowerment of this third angel's message that arrived on October 13th, 2018. Right. That is, it's going to be, it's going to join with this third angel that arrives, which is this specific chronology about November 9th. And we can see that July 18th represents that. Any questions about this? So we definitely have a lot more details here. Yeah, we're screwed. I mean, it's we're, we're kind of messed up on um, the October thing. That's not an eight. That's a, that's a 10. October is the eighth month. Oct means eight. Sept means seven. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. You just you just but, need to practice your Latin a bit. Right. Sorry. But it also but that's not how it sits in our in our uh, counting system as far as months. It used to. Used to. Yes, in the Julian calendar. Right. So, so when, so when they that's, that was part of that notation that I suggested is that we mark it as Julian. Well, the I, J or I, something. No, I just put I just put it as the eighth month. I get it. Everybody should know that you know oct is eight. <laughs> Everybody should. Yeah, that's a presumption, bro. <laughs> How else would you see octopus then? Yeah, or an octagon. I get it. You get it. Yeah. But well, when you start talking with people, they won't get that <laughs> until you tell them about it. Okay. Well, yeah. But we should know now, right, if we look at this. Yes, we. Yeah, and, and these are charts which are going to be put in a study for us. 
So we're I don't know. But we're trying to translate this to people that are I, I part of think, the normal study group. No, I don't think this is going to be anything outside of this movement. This is for us at the present time. This is not a presentation we would present to the world or even to Seventh-day Adventists, I don't think. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that I, I, <laughs> even though you keep saying this movement, I agree with you. Yeah. But I would also say that a lot of people, when you, you f say October, they're not going to see eight until you tell them it. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, well, yeah, but we can <laughs> they tell already them. have a phobia with the numbers and they don't, want, you know, it's already difficult. And so we're trying to make it simple. But people in this movement are going to know, and we would tell them because we're going to tell people, right? So yes. I have eighth month and seventh month. Right. So I think there's enough notes is all I'm saying is there's enough notes there for us right now. But yeah, I mean, most people don't know that when the Julian calendar changed in the United States to the Gregorian, that they counted the start of the year as being um, uh, February, was it February 28th or something like that, or 26th? Or, it was a weird date. Like the year didn't start on January 1st. That's, that's a Gregorian calendar change. So it was really confusing if you if you were born, you know, in January or February, given the year that you were born in when they made the change. So, but that that's a lot of detail. I wouldn't put on a chart here like that. But yeah, so we got September, that means seven, October, oct is eight. Okay. Now it's just I knew this when I was a little kid, so um I have a hard time understanding that somebody wouldn't know that. But, uh, you know, October is 8 and September is 7. Bro, you're the exception, not the rule. Okay. Anyway. So, so that's, that makes sense. Anyway, we're going to close with prayer. We'll come back to. Yeah, it makes good sense, bro. Let's judge. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven. Thank you for this time that we studied here this morning. May your Holy Spirit continue to be with us and help us to understand these things. Help us to recognize uh, the need uh, to have a Christ-like character and to seek your face each morning, noon, and evening, to seek your presence at all times, and uh, to trust in you that you are caring uh, for each person. We pray for those in need, for um the health of, of people's eyes, uh, you know, Dwight and Heidi has some eye problems and things. Uh, we know, Lord, that we need uh, your healing hand upon us and your guidance. And um, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.